and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. This week we're travelling to Russia under the revolutionary rule of Peter the Great. Russian history is full of larger than life characters and moments of high drama. This vast country has experienced political extremes, huge suffering and glittering success, often all at the same time. Ivan the Terrible, Catherine the Great, Lenin, Gorbachev and Rasputin are all well-known figures. But the women whose stories we will be hearing about this week are not so famous, at least in the West, in spite of the astonishing lives they lived. They are the subject of Ellen Alpston's vivid novels, Tsarina, which tells the story of Peter the Great's second wife, and the newly published The Tsarina's Daughter, which carries on the epic tale of her second daughter, Elizabeth, who went on to rule Russia for two decades in the mid-18th century. Alpston brings this fascinating period in Russian history to life, telling the story of how Peter the Great struggled to transform his country into a modern, west-facing nation by defeating the Swedes, founding St Petersburg and creating a navy, amongst a host of other things. We follow his wife Catherine's extraordinary journey from illiterate peasant to ruler of all the Russias and their daughter's story, beginning with her dramatic birth in the romantic wooden palace of Kolomanskoye, in the forests outside Moscow. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Ellen. I'm very much looking forward to our episode today. I'm hoping it's going to be a bit like uh, a holiday, the holiday we all need, um, going to a completely different place and time. Um, We're going to be talking about your book, which is literally about to hit the book stands at any minute. The Tsarina's Daughter, which is a novel set in Russia, and it is the follow-up to your your first novel in this series, which is called Tsarina. Um, and so I thought, before we get into the, the historical detail, could you tell us a bit about your background? How did you uh, end up writing novels? And, and also, more specifically, how did you come to this uh, astonishing story and this, this amazing subject? Well, thank you so much, first of all, for welcoming me on this fantastic, quirky, extraordinary, very interesting podcast. I love the concept. I grew up in the African highlands where my father worked as a vet and my elder brothers were in boarding school. And once a month, I got a very large, abundant um, book parcel by a very loving godmother. So I read a lot. I had plenty of pets, cats, dogs, chicken, geese, uh, a wounded grumpy serval cat, a stroppy polo pony. At times, we even had a baby crocodile in the bathtub up that later was eaten by an eagle and I was really relieved about that but anyways <laughs> lots of these pets I dressed up and they had to listen to my story so I did my little pet school and then when we returned to Europe I had very lonely years very unhappy years because we moved to this tiny village that had more cattle than human inhabitants and everything that was different of course was viewed as dangerous or and and I was mobbed and my only re- My saving grace was really going to the library and getting books by the washing basket and a lot of historic novels. The old historic novels we're speaking about, Gone with the Wind, Desiree, Sinoué, I, Claudius. And something about this mix of instruction entertainment just gripped me and I thought, yes, how amazing. It allowed me time travel, perfect escapism, perhaps not always a holiday. And I doubt that Serena, that Serena's (laughs) daughter would be your perfect holiday. And then I had teachers who encouraged me and who said, you know what, you have a gift and you should continue you should work that gift because no work, no gift is just perfect as it is as James Patterson said before he ever published a word he had written a million words before and I think this is how it is for everybody who wants to be an author and at university then I participated in a short story competition and won it with a short story called um, Meeting Mr Gandhi of which no trace um, is to be found <laughs> <laughs> 
so um, that was how I got into writing. And then I moved to London for my first job, which was a graduate trainee scheme in a big PR agency, and then thought, I have to do something about this. If I really want to be an author, I have to get serious. And I earned so little money and I hardly knew anyone. So I just sat in my little room in the house of horrors, as we called it, and, and wrote every evening until I was ready to present it. And how did you become interested in Russia? That is an excellent story. That are both, first of all, an excellent question. Um, my family has got a very ambivalent relationship to Russia because my father grew up in the GDR and he still remembers very vividly the day the American tanks left in the morning and the Soviet tanks rolled into his village, which was just really a stone throw away from the later border between East and, and, and Western Germany. Um, he could still recognize the three armies, the German army, the American army, the Soviet army by its smell, he says, um, as a doctor. Um, son, he was not allowed to study, so he fled at the age of 16 through a night forest before uh, the wall was built, he had been forced to learn Russian, so it takes him five cognacs and then he, then he sings the national Soviet anthem. Oh, wow, you should write his story maybe, that sounds <laughs> I that's know, amazing. I know, he, he's a fantastic man, fantastic character. In the same time, I have a cousin who owns her own publishing house in Berlin and who publishes only latter-day Russian intellectuals. So it's a very, it's a very ambiguous relationship we have. My heroines, I discovered at the age of 13, reading a book called Germans and Russians about the millennial history of these two people that have suffered so much in history as no other people have and who are still bound by this innate understanding for tragedy and beauty in their creation and who are marked by a mutual love-hate and deep fascination for each other. And one chapter in that book was devoted to Tsarina, um, Catherine the first who was born as an illiterate serf Marta because she was born as a Baltic German <clears throat> serf so this is how I came about the subject and writing about Russia. Wow goodness me so how do you when it comes to writing historical fiction how do you approach the balance between your writing fiction this is a story and you are basing it on truth so where do you draw that line how much research do you do and how much is it imagination? You know what, Violet, I think if I had known which world of Tolkien-esque dimensions I was going to enter, perhaps I would have never dared writing these novels because in the end I did research for more than a year before I wrote the opening sentence of Tsarina. I did so much. I read the Russian classics, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Gogol. I watched movies like The Ark, Battleship Potemkin. Of course, contemporary sources. There's a fantastic travel diary of a German merchant who visits the father of Peter the Great and says, oh, my God, these people are really not better than animals. He's completely shocked by Russia um, at the time. And I also read Russian fairy tales and myths. And in the Tsarina's daughter, you find a very strong supernatural element which smuggled itself into the story because all of a sudden I realized, my God, none of these spirits in the Russian mystique or mythology is good. They're all ill willing. And I found that fascinating. What does that tell you about a people's relationship to their nature and their very harsh and unforgiving climate? Um, so I had to introduce this Delphic prophecy that my heroine is getting. So vast research as a framework. So what they wear, what they eat, how they travel, um, how their houses look, uh, where they were at what moment, all that is correct. And in between then comes the free dance of my heroines who are at heart very modern women. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the food and the, and, and the clothes actually, because they were two things that really just bring your story so much to life and the descriptions of what they're eating and these, these incredible, you know, quite a lot of the things you don't, you can't imagine what they taste like or what, what they are, but it really adds to the feeling of being in a very different place, which I think is so, um, well, it's so, so attractive always. It's one of the reasons we lo everyone loves fiction, but it's also at the moment, is this, it's especially played into something in me that just is desperate to get away from England and go somewhere else. <laughs> and did you visit, have you spent time in, in Russia? Do you, have you been to visit the places that you describe? This is actually interesting because I only visited St. Petersburg 
after I had written Serena. Somehow I had written it while working as a TV network anchor and it was just very, a very gruesome life. I actually, I worked breakfast television shifts. I got up at two o'clock in the morning. The car came to pick me up at 2.30. My downstairs neighbor thought I worked as a hooker because she heard me, <laughs> she heard me cantering down the stairs at every godforsaken hour. Um, I came home at 12, slept for three hours, went on writing, went to bed at nine o'clock, repeat. Um, by the end of that, I was so exhausted that I was actually written off work for two months. I really struggled with my mental health. I had tried to juggle too much. Um, and actually, again, writing with Serena's daughter was the loneliness of the pandemic that I found hard to bear. So there's always something as, as for everybody. And when you did visit then, because you, you obviously had you know, imagined it in, 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 inside yourself uh, in a very profound way so when you got there and you actually were in the city in real life as it were did it live up to your expectations was it the same was it different how, how that must have been a very strange experience it was absolutely stunning just the scope of the city and that it actually this the creation of this city just this one man saying right here i'm going to build a city in 1703 and 20 years later you know everything had arisen the canals the bridges the flat fronted um, facade palaces everything peter the great had seen abroad i mean critics called it a bastard architecture already at the time. Um, it's just amazing. It shows you the sheer force of human will. It shows you the sheer force of the Tsar's will, who of course has got the whole of Russia as his disposal and above all that ground cover of the Russian society, which are the serfs, hundreds of millions of people. Nothing is as abundant and superfluous as human life. And of course, then you can build a city like St. Petersburg. Yeah. So we've now dipped a little bit, we dipped in a little bit to um, the, our subject. And you've mentioned that Peter the Great uh, founded St. Petersburg in 1703. And so can you just tell us a little bit, I know this is an enormous question uh, and I'm asking you to condense it down into a, a, a nice concise answer, but can you just give us a general idea of Russian history so we're at the beginning of the 18th century just give us a, an idea of what Russia is at this point and also the political system because the Romanovs are a newly founded dynasty and the, the even the title of Tsar is, is quite new isn't it so can you just fill us in a bit on the background Yes. So the Rus Empire started in Kiev in the 12th century, funny enough, with a ruler who was married to the daughter of Harold II, Harold Godwinson, who left his life, uh, lost his life in, in, in battle against William the Conqueror. So there you have a nice link. Um, the most famous Tsar of that dynasty is probably Ivan the Terrible. And that dynasty then died out and was followed by the so-called Times of Troubles, which was horrendous for Russia, the Cossack occupation is something that is not remembered very favorably in, in, in Russian law. And to end that, the boyars, the aristocrats said, right, we need a new leader, we need a new strong man. And their eyes fell on Mikhail Romanov. So in 1613, that dynasty was voted onto the throne. So he was not a strong man, he was actually a priest's son. He didn't have a particular interest in being a Tsar. And the Tsar, of course, has got its linked to the Roman word of Caesar. We still hear that in there. And if there ever was an omnipotent ruler, it is the Tsar. Everything that belongs to a Russian belongs first and foremost to him. And everybody's life and death in this world's largest and wealthiest realm is at his fingertips. It is nowadays unbelievable, the, the scope of their power. Um, later on, palaces of five, 600 rooms dotted all over the country. Every jewelry is basically pigeon egg sized. And again, just this absolutely disposable human life that makes, of course, everything possible. And so they voted him. So they hadn't got, it wasn't like in Western Europe where we'd, we had these monarchies where the throne was traditionally passed from uh, eldest son to eldest son. Obviously that was the theory. It didn't often end up being that convenient. But they didn't have that tradition in Russia in the same way. That tradition had ended with the Rurik Tsars dying out. There was no more son 
available and then the Cossacks sort of took opportunity of that weakness of that already vast empire and just overran it that golden horde coming in basically and leaving no choice and a lot a lot in the Slavic nature nowadays is credited actually to that Cossack occupation you know that long slumbering of the Russian bear this enduring of hardship until all of a sudden they wake and explode with an incredible anchor so this enduring of hardship is credited um, to that Cossack occupation because they had to endure so much. And there were other things that were inherited from that. Interestingly enough, at the time of Peter the Great, when he was a boy, women almost lived like in the Arabic countries. They were completely hidden from view, at least women of higher standing. And they lived in a terem where only their, their fathers and their brothers saw them and perhaps later on their husband. For a Tsar's daughter, the life was even harder because she was never supposed to marry. She received no education. She lived a sheer monastic life because any Russian was too low for her to marry. And a foreigner was a heathen who did not have the Russian Orthodox faith. So that is something Peter the Great changed. Was it to the benefit for the women of his house? That remains to be seen in the Tsarina's daughter. I do give an answer to that question. Mm. And so Peter the Great um, becomes bizarre and changes everything i mean he he sort of revolutionizes the, the whole the laws the traditions the so just talk a little bit about that and and maybe now is the moment i i love that um sentence in your book i should have copied it down when they describe him turning the country from being east facing to being west facing so just tell us a bit about Peter the Great and, and also his his grand embassy, because that was very, very important, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I think the sentence is that he twists the country's face from the semi-Asian Muscovy to the half European Russia like a doll's head. So forces his people to look westwards. And yes, his his inspiration for the westernization of Russia, which was really a very backward country where uh, people had no education, uh, people wore very different clothes that in the West, was that worse, was that better, remains to be seen. Again, I'll come, come to that later. Um, all that inspiration he received when he left um, age 20 on the Grand Embassy for three years to travel through the West and he learned on the shipyards in the Netherlands and he learned a lot in London. Interestingly enough, in London he learned everything which he later applied for the building of St. Petersburg because he felt in the Netherlands there was a code he couldn't grasp. Whilst here in England, where he visited everything, Oxford University, he went to the Greenwich Planetarium, or what was there already of it at the time. And of course, the, the docks that helped him founding that beautiful city. And coming back, he really changed everything. The laws of succession, the way the army was drafted, um, the way schooling was done, the way people dressed. And he didn't give a dime if, you know, those tightly fitting clothes of uh, thin, cheap European cloth were actually not at all suited to the Russian climate. So outside every village, he hung up dolls, mannequins, wearing dresses. This is what a man has to look and this is what a woman has to look. And if you don't do it, you will be fined or punished very severely. And this is something that I found very hard doing my research for Tsarina, the Tsarina's daughter, the shocking ingenuity they had of how to torture each other, put each other to death, to punish each other. If you don't pull your cap quickly enough, you get it nailed to your forehead. So how's that? So um, people did change their clothes. Can I just say that? <laughs> they, they didn't think it was wiser to obey the Tsar. But some things caused terrible revolts. For instance, he forced all men to be clean shaven. And of course, on the icons, Christ the Savior wears a beard. So being clean shaven was, was blasphemy for a man of Russian Orthodox faith. And of course, the church did not like that, but he was not afraid of making himself enemies, never ever. And it sounds like some of the things that he picked up when he was traveling in Europe were, were positive. And I know that, you know, that he, he founded the Russian Navy, which would have a huge influence. And, and no doubt he was inspired by being in England, because at that time, the English Navy was the, the greatest in the world. But it also sounds like some of the ideas were just a bit random and a bit unnecessary. I mean, what, why make poor Russian peasants wear sort of thin uh, dresses? They, surely they all then died of cold and exposure. 
Yes, and especially who could afford, you know, going to the tailor and buy new clothes. A, a Russian peasant probably had one shirt and, and one long coat or, or dress, the sarafans that even Marta wears as a young woman in Sarina, and which are actually very beautiful. And the embroidery of which is almost like a secret language in the families, you know, where the patterns are handed down from mother to daughter. Um, I just think it was done in great haste. Again, actually like the St. Petersburg, I think it's Kazakhstan Nova, who wrote later on, St. Petersburg is the city built in hurry by a man in haste. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everything was just started, but quickly, quickly, you know, everything, roads that had been paved six months ago immediately needed repaving, roofs lost their tiles at the slightest breeze. Um, so everything was just hasty and half-baked because he felt he had no time. Peter the Great himself would rise at three or four o'clock in the morning and just shoot off a volley of letters right away in all directions to generals, to thinkers, to courtiers, to the administration. And it was always quick immediately now <laughs> okay so so now we've got quite a clear um picture of peter uh, what he was like and so i think now i'm going to ask you the question we ask all of our guests which is um if you could travel back in time which year would you like to visit well, definitely when it comes to Serena series, I think the year 1709 is a very decisive year because what Peter the Great saw as well on his travels and then coming back was that Russia to survive needed an ice-free port. Now, who possessed these ice-free ports in the vicinity of Russia? Not him, but the Swedes, who were by then the supreme power in Europe. This is something a lot of people have completely forgotten. You know, when we today think of Sweden, we think of ABBA and we think of IKEA meatballs and we think of cute little names for our shelves. This is not what the Swedes were 400 years ago. No other power was feared as they were, even in the 30 year war, all over Europe, you've got addresses dotted, like uh, the Swedes K, the Swedes Square, go to Vienna, go to Berlin, go to Hanover, go to Paris. And you have addresses reminding us of the horror that the Swedish occupation meant. Um, so in 1701, upon his return from the great embassy, Peter the Great took a tiny slight, a Swedish soldier did not allow him the entrance to the fortress of Riga, which he wanted to visit, rightly so, because it was a Swedish fortress. So what was the Tsar of Russia doing there? He took that slight as a pretext to declare war to the Swedes, because he knew he had to get rid of them in order for Russia to survive. And that was the beginning of the Great Northern War. And let's just talk a little bit um, before we go to your first scene about the actual geography of this, because when I was doing a bit of research around this subject, I was um, in my ignorance, very surprised to read that Peter the Great founded St. Petersburg on a part of land, uh, uh, on land which he had won from the Swedes. So uh, before this um, Great Northern War, where, what, what is Russia? What, what is Russia made of? And what is Sweden made of in terms of um, land mass? Russia is actually already very much of what we know today. And the corner of Europe, Sweden and Russia fought for for 20 years at tremendous human cost and suffering is tiny. It is just the Baltics. It is what we today call Estonia, um, Livonia, um, you know, Letland. I can't even get them all together. It is just really those, those, those Vilnius, uh, Tallinn, Riga, those cities are what we're speaking about. So for that, they fought 20 years. This is all. That's everything. And so what about where Finland is now? Because now obviously Finland is in between Russia and Sweden. So were they also fighting for that area of land? Finland came almost as um, a victor spoil afterwards, because of course Finland was even icier than many other spots in, right, in okay. Russia. So it belonged to Swedes, it belonged to Charles XII, who is their fondly beloved warrior king even though he brought so much suffering upon, upon his people as well. Um, the most important were really those cities, those harbors, Riga, Königsberg, Kaliningrad of today. That, that was what Peter the Great wanted. And indeed, he founded St. Petersburg after capturing a fortress, which he later called Schlüsselburg, which means the key castle. Because for mm -hmm. him, capturing this castle that really sits in fly-infested swamps 
Well, St. Petersburg is on very swampy land as well. Uh, it, it is, it is. Again, millions of serfs or hundreds of thousands of serfs just had to, you know, dig out these canals. So this key castle was where he then founded uh, St. Petersburg and hence the name Schlüsselburg. Mm. And of course, these ports were so important because of trade, because that was the way to get towards, um, get all the furs and uh, um, wood and everything else that they were trading. That was a major trade route out down towards Western Europe. Yes, absolutely. And of course, then for his navy too, his beloved navy that he founded, as you said. Um, okay, so I think now we can go to your first scene, um, which is um, we're in a town called Poltava in the Ukraine. Is that correct? So take us there what, and describe what, what's happening. What, what are we going to witness? So in the beginning of the Great Northern War, there were a couple of big battles. One of them was when Peter the Great chances upon his later wife, who is then a prisoner of war. And after that, it was basically just a hide and seek game where Peter the Great was trying to run away from the Swedes, trying to keep them at bay. And at some point, they were only a couple of hundred kilometers outside Moscow. Um, so he knew there was a very realistic chance that Peter the Great would lose this battle and that Russia would become Swedish. Then he all of a sudden remembered a very trusted ally that every Russian leader all the way through to Stalin could ever count on, and that is the Russian winter. So he applies this horrific weapon that is um, called the scorched earth. So in the middle of winter, he knows where the Swedes will go. He just chases his own people from the villages. He kills all the livestock. He burns all the houses. He burns all the churches. Um, he poisons the wells by throwing carcasses in them. He throws ashes on the fields. And then the snow comes. So the Swedes are basically marching into starvation, into their death. And then he waits for them outside Poltava, which is a big city in the then in, in, in the Ukraine. So when Charles, this 12 men arrive, they're already half starved. You can almost compare it um, to the battle between William the Conqueror and Harold II again, when Harold II had to come down from Stamford Bridge. So he very cleverly used this advantage, Peter the Great. Um, he struck up camp, his men well fed, rearing to go. He was there on his white Arab stallion, Finette, a horse of unbelievable, incredible beauty. He had very well planned his attack, Peter the Great was a true military genius who just adored being in the field. He loved being in the field. He was never happier than sleeping on a foldable camp bed in a very simple tent, as long as it was warm. He abhorred the cold, so there was always a fire going, even in the summer. So come dawn, he would ride out on Finette. All his men was there. The Russian army was one that shocked by its sheer sheer size in those days. Having an army of 100,000 men was absolutely unbelievable. Just the size of these people. And I mean, they were ill shod and they were half uniformed and who knew if they had breakfast, but they were there. <laughs> and Peter the Great just galloped along their lines. And I think I will cry because I'm so taken with this, you know, and gave them this rousing speech, you know, basically telling them that he would be the first to ride in battle and he would be the first to fall but if this was the price to pay for Russia he would do it so they just rose like a single you know green wave and just flooded that battlefield where the Swedes waited for them basically skeleton standing in in in, in Swedish uniform and they won and actually Peter the Great was saved twice so one bullet that was intended for him got stuck in the wooden front of his saddle, which was quite high, protecting his waistline, I suppose, from saddles. And the other one got stuck in a golden big breast cross he wore. So clearly recognizable as any for everybody. He was the Tsar. He wore this enormous golden breast cross that the monks of Mount Athos had given to his brother, who was Tsar Fyodor before him, as a gift. And the bullet got stuck in that, protecting his heart. So he, of course, took that as a sign. And um, whilst Charles XII actually managed to flee at the Battle of Poltava, he was hurt in his heel and it was a wound that would later kill him. Then he fled together with the treasure chest, unlucky enough. He fled um, to the high port in Constantinople where the Sultan gave him refuge. And Peter the Great just took everybody prisoner whom he could, all the ministers, all the cooks, all the soldiers, all the generals. There's one very strong scene in Tsarina 
where he asks for his sword and the Swedish general kneels in front of him and everybody holds their breath and just hopes that he will not sully this victory by basically executing or murdering this very brave general who for years has hunted and haunted him. And then when the general has prayed and just has his eye closed, he just takes the general's hand and puts his swords in it and said, here, take it, because you've been such a soldier for all these years and uh, you have caused me so much trouble that I deeply respect you. Um, so that is the wow. battlefield of Poltava. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing, amazing image, isn't it? And so that was it for the Swedes. I mean, that was really the end of the Swedish reign of terror, if we can call it that, over Europe. Was that the beginning of their decline? It was the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the Great Northern War went on for another 12 years until they finally concluded the Peace of Neustadt, with, which is this year, the 300 year anniversary. And I'm delighted because I'm giving a big interview to the Russian state television that will be aired all over Russia on uh, the 10th of September for the 300 year anniversary. So by then it was just again a hide and seek chasing of little armies and of course another encounter then with Charles uh, the 12th, the Battle of Proof, which is a defining moment for Peter the Great and Serena, but that's a completely different yeah, story now. For another time. Um, so let's go, let's continue onward um, to your second scene please, which I believe is in Moscow, which is the very old capital city of Russia, where St. Petersburg is the new capital city. Could you could you describe it like that? Or Yes, you could. In 1709, you could. You could also say that St. Petersburg, of course, is in still in full construction. Peter the Great and his companion, Marta, by then still live in the little wooden hut that he had built himself as his first house in St. Petersburg. Nothing is finished yet. Uh, the Summer Palace, I think, was kind of finished in 1711. The Winter Palace, perhaps the foundation was laid. But of course, everything took a long time, despite mm. um, all that material being available. So he moved the victory parade for Poltava to Moscow. It took place in December. The battle in itself took place in June. So we see there was a moment in between. And whom he wanted by his side was his companion, Marta the heroine of Tsarina, who already was pregnant when she had joined him in the Battle of Poltava and when she was riding over the battlefield uh, to join him at his moment of triumph. But she cannot join him for a good reason on the balcony to watch him crossing the Red Square. And it is the biggest victory parade Russia and probably the world by then had ever seen. As we know it from communist, communistic days, you know, just this, um, this idea of living pictures of 10,000s of people moving to an invisible, silent choreography, something that has been rehearsed, all these prisoners of war coming in, looking completely torn in shreds, the Russian people howling at them, um, the Kremlin fortress that was founded almost five, 600 years earlier by the Dolgoruki family, so forbidding, the beautiful bulbous tops of the St. Vasilis Cathedral, uh, church bells ringing, the Tsar himself, you know, Finette, his steed is decked out in gold and leopard skin. He's standing in his stirrups, he's shouting, uh, he's jubilating, the vodka is flowing from the fountains, he's throwing gold coins into the masses. So this is the victory parade um, of Poltava. And each and single one of those of those prisoners uh, were actually sent to Siberia to work in mines or to St. Petersburg to pave the streets. Indeed, the prime minister of Charles XII was sent to St. Petersburg and had to tile roofs. I don't know how well he did it, but there he was. <laughs> That's an amazing detail to have. Uh, and is this a very traditional thing, this kind of victory parade? Because you, you, you talk about in communist times, you, we're very used to seeing those images, as you, as you say, of thousands and thousands of people all you know moving in time. And, and so this is a very old idea. Do you think it's taken from the, the Roman um, victory parades? Do you think that's where it comes from? Definitely. And I think it's also an effort of PR. Of course, in days before we had television, this was a moment to show the people this is what you're suffering for. This is why we're doing this, because here they are. Here's our enemy. And if you think of Cleopatra, who rather committed suicide than being dragged along on a Russian victory parade, it is indeed a very old idea. And of course, a moment of retribution, a moment where you say, OK, this is why we're doing this and we stand victorious, we stand mm. tall. What a moment to have been there. That, that really would have been something to behold, wouldn't it? 
Uh, especially and, the free vodka spouting from the fountain. And the free vodka. <laughs> from, yeah, we've had a couple of interviews in this season about similar kind of celebrations in London and about the wine flowing from the fountain. So it's very much a theme of um, celebrations in that kind of period. You can't imagine what kind of chaos it would cause if, if they did it now. Hello, it's Artemis. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colourgraph.co. At colourgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colourisation work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum-grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colourised photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, you're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. Um, Okay, so you hinted briefly there um, about the reason that the Tsarina, can we call her that? She's not, has she been made Tsarina yet? But yes, uh, Peter the Great's uh, second wife, why she can't be there with him on the balcony um, witnessing this great victory parade. So um, can you take us to uh, our third scene? I'm not going to try and pronounce the name of the palace. I'm going to leave that to you because I have no idea. But describe it because the description of it in your book is so, so compelling and um, wonderful. So um, when Peter the Great's companion, Marta, so the illiterate serf whom he met as a prisoner of war, uh, was pregnant with her first daughter, Anushka, he, as a gift, offered her an old timber palace that his father had built, a hunting palace outside Moscow, and it's called Kolomanskoye. And whilst Moscow was built without any plan and the city coils sort of like a snail around his heart, which is um, the Kremlin, and St. Petersburg was really planned from scratch, almost like Manhattan for our understanding, Kolomanskoye is, even if you see it today, it almost arises like a dream. It combines all the different architectural styles that you can find all over the Russian Empire. And it lies nestled in vast parklands, got orchards, very beautiful, uh, very mysterious ravine, <laughs> mm. where, which is said to be haunted and there are rumours of time travel going on in there. So to this palace, Marta retired after the Battle of Poltava to give birth to another child. It was by then her fifth or sixth pregnancy she had while being together with Peter the Great. Sadly, only two of the 12 children she bore him reached adulthood. And in particular, she was desperate to give him a son and heir because he had a son from his first marriage with whom he was not very happy. Um, so she goes, she travels to Kolymanskoye where she will be calm. She goes to this bedchamber. Labor starts, she's determined that this child will be healthy, it will be a boy. Um, It is the most difficult and the most heavy of births. Uh, She suffers because the baby lies the wrong way around. Not only is it a stargazer, so the baby's spine pressing against her spine causing unbearable pain, it's also being born feet first. So uh, the child is born, she sees the midwife, um, crossing herself in horror and sits up and says, oh, he he will be, I'll call him Peter. He'll be called Peter like his father. And um, the doctor just, you know, just takes the baby and turns to her and I said, it's a girl. And um, the midwife is in complete shock and says, this is the worst feet first, stargazing up to the December sky. Um, she's a wolverine. So she's already born at this ominous moment. She's the princess of Poltava, this girl, Elizabeth, who is the Tsarina's daughter. And she's born in Kolomenskoye, which is built on old Russian earth. Kolomenskoye in a way stands for everything that Peter the Great later hated and he tried to put away with. It's a corner of old Russia. 
Um, so the fact that Elizabeth was born there, she later very cleverly used, if you want so, she was actually the first people's princess. Because at a moment later on in her life, when Russia is threatened to succumb to all the spirits her father has called, and Russia can actually not master that westernization anymore, and all the Russians are losing hold, every high office is given to a foreigner, she calls upon everything that is Russian. She says, I love the Russian songs, I love the dress and dress, and she becomes the first people's princess. And in my opinion, this myth actually started in this bedchamber in the palace of Kolomanskoye, where she was born and where she grew up indeed, because while Anushka and her were girls, their steady companion was loneliness, and they grew up like peasants girls, lucky them perhaps you know, lucky to run bare feet, lucky to ruffle in the leaves and bathe in lakes and build massive snow women and snowmen instead of being cosseted in the winter palace and probably catching consumption um, because their mother was just forever traveling with a tsar, afraid, of course, that another woman would, would take her position away. Indeed, it took another three or four years until the tsar married her. And that was something that always haunted Elizabeth as well because she was born out of wedlock. And um, when her parents' death opened a revolving door to the power in Russia, uh, and indeed one of the most complicated times in the Russian history, that is the rich in complications, people always pointed their finger on her and saying, well, you, you were born out of wedlock. You've got no right whatsoever. So when the moment comes to claim what is hers, it comes at a terrible price. But ruling Russia is not for wimps. No, well, can you? You have to. You can't leave us hanging like that. I mean, I know I can by the book. <laughs> yes, but we have to just explain to people that that she became Empress of Russia. I mean, it's just the most astonishing story. And and she wasn't just Empress for a short while. While you know she was regent for some son or nephew, she she ruled for yes. Once years, once she had seized power. Years. Um, she ruled for 20 years and remarkably enough, she's actually the first ruler in the world who abolished the death penalty. Of course, you can always knout somebody and torture somebody which results in death. But on paper, she had abolished the death penalty. And in those days, that was a monumental. I mean, there was, as you said, rulers, people were just dispensable to, in, entirely, weren't they? Yes, and of course, instilling fear in people, the terror, the sheer terror of your reign was a very powerful tool. Um, so letting that go was a very conscious decision. And, but I, I truly think that, I mean, in the book, the prologue and then the epilogue where it ends, it is a horrific moment. And I think it must have weighed on her because she really did not sleep in the same room for these 20 years, two nights running because she was always afraid that would happen to her, what she had done to Ivan yeah. in the book, what she had to do to Ivan. Yeah. And she really, where she, if she put Ivan's body and mind on the altar, sacrificing him for Russia, she certainly did add her soul. But she had come to that point. It was him or her. And uh, there was no more choice. I think that big unlikely love story that she lives and in a way again a reflection actually of her mother's love story with Peter the Great but to the inverse you know she's can't say more spoiler spoiler yeah, yeah. but it's absolutely lovely that gave her the strength to become who she was it gave her the strength to rise above this oh you can't do this you can't do that already her path had been stony and she had refused any second rate match or refused to retire to a convent. She had gone her way and now she had to go it to the end. And she did. And how do you think, I mean, I'm really, um, part of me, I, you know, I'm very ignorant about Russian history. I, you know, I did history A level and guess what? We focused on the, uh, you know, later Russian history, the, the sort of very political 20th century stuff and actually the, the more I do this podcast and the more uh, of the uh, books I read about subjects which I wouldn't necessarily pick up of my own accord the crosser I become with the people who whoever it is that you know sets the curriculum because there's so many areas of history which are just absolutely fascinating and um anyway that's a a, a personal um rant of mine but I wonder how you know I'd never heard of um, I mean, I've, I've heard of Catherine the Great, but I'd never heard of um, 
of either of these two women. And I wonder if that is just me being particularly badly educated. And I wonder how they are seen in, um, in Russia. So do Russian school children learn about these women? And is this, you know, held up as a period of history which women were allowed to come to the fore or women came to the fore and, and took the lead and that was a good thing or not? Do you have any idea? Yes, it actually is. Interestingly enough, even though whilst my research shocked me in a way that there was just this constant rampant maltreatment of women, it is equally a moment of of course, women coming to the forefront. And yes, of course, because we have this unique century of female reign that flies into the face of a very brutal, very determined patriarchy. Peter the Great himself was uh, beloved by the Soviets because he, stand, of co he stood, of course, for, for progress. He stood for belief in the country. He stood for pushing the country forward. So everything the Soviets wanted. And on paper, the Soviet regime was actually good for women as well. It was one of the first regimes yeah. in the world that allowed divorce, for instance, and, uh, you know, looked after the children, of course, with the aim that women could go to the factories. And there's always a sinister political aim behind all these <laughs> decisions, yeah. I think. Um, but it's true because I do, I work a lot with the Russian media here in London. There are a lot of magazines and newspapers that aim at Russians here in London. I've done interviews with them, written features for them. And uh, they say, what do you mean? Nobody has ever heard of them. We all have heard of them. <laughs> So, of course, they know them, but I think they like that I see these books as a piece of literary diplomacy. And you remember Winston Churchill's old adage that Russia is like an enigma wrapped in a riddle, yeah. hidden inside a mystery. And if my books can help you understand Russia a little bit better, and they can, because so much what is there is still here today. You know, nothing has changed that much in the social makeup of the country. No, and you can't understand a country unless you know about its history, I don't think. I don't think you can appreciate a culture because culture is just the sum of, of the history, isn't it, really? It's what's, what's Yeah, happening. exactly, exactly. But of course, I mean, I understand your rant and I feel the same, but history is just so vast and so rich. I suppose you have to take your collective pick. <laughs> yeah, I just think my pick would have been quite different to what I was actually... Ah, oh, the Tudors are okay. Come on. Oh no! I mean, I didn't even do the Tudors hardly. I would love. I love the Tudors. Primary school, you do the Tudors. At primary school, you do the Tudors, and then it's just basically the First World War, the Second World War, and the Cold War, and that's it for the rest of until you get to university. And and then I sp specialized in medieval history. I was very firmly moving away from all of that. But uh, yeah, I I think it's fascinating, and and I love. I love historical novels and I loved, I've loved i loved reading your book and I'm definitely going to buy um, the first one and I would urge our listeners to as well. But before I let you go, I have one final question to ask you. If you could have picked something up from one of these scenes and brought it back with you to the present to keep as your own, what would it be? From the Tsarina's daughter, it's definitely the amulet she wears, the amulet of St. Nicholas, who is the patron saint of Russia, because I thought it was such a fantastic coincidence that she seizes the reins of power on the evening of St. Nicholas Day, which is the 6th of December, and something that we celebrate a lot in the Germanic countries as well, and of course in, in the Russian Orthodox faith. So she gets gifted this amulet, which is encrusted with diamonds, beautiful miniature painting, and she wears it on a simple leather string around her neck. And for me, that shows the meeting of the old and the new Russia, of the coarse and of the elegant, of all these contrasts that she and her life combines with stunning simplicity. And I think if I could, I, I, I would have that amulet in my I, hand here, clutching it. I think that's a wonderful choice. Then you could, have, you could also wear it around your neck on a chain. I think that's a really wonderful choice. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's been a fascinating um, journey with you today. And um, I wish you every success with the Sarina's daughter. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was hugely emotional. At times I was really close to tears. So I hope, the, I hope everybody understands what I wanted to say. <laughs> I'm sure they did. And that's very Russian. I mean, that's, you know, the Russians are very emotional too, aren't they? Yeah, true. And um, it makes us human. That was me, Violet Moller, talking to Ellen Alpston the other day. Her compelling books, 
Tsarina and the Tsarina's Daughter are both on sale in all good bookshops now. They are a great way to escape the trials and tribulations of the present. Really entertaining and interesting. If you would like any more information, please go and have a look at our beautiful website, tttpodcast.com. It would also be great if you could rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This is my last episode this season, so thank you for listening, and I hope you have a safe and sunny summer. Goodbye. <laughs>